All right, we're continuing our study through the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis 3 today. Let's go ahead and bow in a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would bless it now as we seek to understand these difficult things, Lord, these images that are not from our world, but from the world of the past. Uh, we tend to want to read them very literally because I think we're, we're afraid of the images, that we're, they're not as concrete in our mind as we would like them to be. And, uh, and we're not so sure about what you're communicating then because it's, it's not something we're familiar with. Father, I pray that you just open our minds to understand the word, to see the message flow through these chapters, because it is so important to understand what you are seeking to convey to your people. Uh, we thank you so much for the resources you've given to us to understand it more fully in our day. Uh, but we do understand that these things take a, a particular mindset uh, that has long been uh, gone from the, the earth. And so help us as I seek to explain them and we seek to understand them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 3, let's go ahead and read that now. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are, are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. All right, so back to verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now let's stop right there. So now we have an image of a serpent, the Nachash. Uh, and the Nachash is in the garden. And so there's so much that goes on about wondering who this serpent is and what it is. You've got people, I think Calvin argued it's just a literal snake. 
um, and uh, maybe a snake that was talking and given the, the ability to talk. You've got some Jewish uh, rabbis who argue that God gave the ability of all the animal, for all the animals to talk at one time. Um, and so between this serpent here or Balaam's donkey, they, they once had that, but then the curse came and then no, none of the animals could talk anymore. Uh, that's not, I don't think that's really what's going on. So, um, the imagery of a talking serpent in the ancient Near East would have been recognized right away as the, a divine creature, some sort of supernatural being. You have, for instance, in Egyptian literature, this man sails to the island of the Ka, which is, uh, the, uh, the spirit in Egyptian literature, one of the ideas of the spirit. And, um, and it, so it's a spiritual I- island. The, he talks to a snake, a talking snake, has a crown on his head, which indicates royalty and, and divinity in some way. And you understand that the talking snake is a supernatural being, not, not some literal snake that he's talking to or something. And, and uh, the fact that it says any other beast of the field, the field, remember, is outside the garden. The field is the uncreated land. So this is a wild animal, and they're often used, especially the snake, uh, as imagery as a chaos creature. That is uh, a creature who represents chaos. And in fact, I'd argue that the serpent itself is the top agent of chaos in the ancient Near East. So you have the Apophis in the Egyptian literature. The Apophis is what like swallows the sun up at night, and it goes to battle with Ra and all that sort of thing. Um, the storm god in Hittite literature battles serpents. The uh, storm god in Canaanite literature battles Leviathan, which is a serpent. You have uh, the scripture itself talk about God grabbing the serpent by the tail, and it's clearly talking about chaos by the tail. Um, you've got uh, Marduk uh, battles Tiamat, which is the primordial waters, but Tiamat often is depicted as the serpentine dragon in Mesopotamian literature, in, in iconography. And so the serpent is, would have been understood as a chaos creature. It's of the field. It's not of the garden, not of the created space. It's of the outlands, which would represent really the Netherland, uh, Netherland uh, sorry, the netherworld, not Netherland, uh, the netherworld. And so, um, he, and then he talks. And so you understand this is a divine creature, a supernatural being, that's now talking to Eve in the garden. And this should not be a shock to anyone. There are divine beings in the garden. I mean, we're told that there are cherubs that are eventually put at the, the head of the garden. God's in the midst of the garden. So there would be angels in the garden. There are animals in the garden. So it, this idea is that there is both earthly creatures and heavenly creatures all meeting in this sanctuary together uh, with God. So they're in here, and remember, God has told them not to eat from a certain tree, and and this is how the the conversation picks up. Now, it it starts with the Hebrew uh, phrase, off-key. Off-key usually is in the middle of some sort of conversation. So we're really getting them in the middle of a conversation. This is not really how the conversation opens up. So he said uh, to the woman, did God actually say, you will not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you may not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, uh, lest you die. Now, just to be clear, the word touch here is used throughout Genesis to talk about actually like God touching something and harming it, uh, putting a plague on something. It may refer to you're, you're not allowed to eat it, but neither are you allowed to uproot it. You're not allowed to pull it out, kill it. It has to actually stay there. Um, it, it's hard to know if that's the connotation here because you don't have anything explicit in the context. It could just mean that Eve is adding, a lot of commentators think Eve is adding things, showing that she doesn't really know the original command firsthand. That was Adam. Um, Adam is with her, as we'll find out. Uh, in the end of this whole thing, he's actually standing there with her and he's not correcting her about anything. But he's not really doing anything at this point. So, uh, Verse four, but the, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. And this is emphatic in Hebrew. So dying, you will not die. You'll absolutely not die. 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, the knowing good and evil, I think, is a little bit of a mistranslation. You have a participle here. It's knowers of good and evil. And I said before, a knower of good and evil is someone who has mastery over something. Remember what good and evil have been so far in Genesis. Imagine you have no idea of what good and evil are in the Bible. You're not thinking in those terms. You've just read Genesis 1 and 2. What is Tov in Genesis 1 and 2? That which is creational and pushes toward the, uh, the creation of humanity and preservation of human life, right? So it's that which creates a, a space that man can live in and therefore fills it up with man. It's that which goes against chaos. Evil is that which goes toward chaos. And God is able to be a master over both of these in terms of he can form chaos into order. Uh, the devil is using the ambiguity, because remember the tree is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, that's very ambiguous. Does that mean that you can become a knower, a master of good and evil by partaking of it? Or as later what God says that the the two have become like us in knowing, that is the infinitive, knowing good and evil, that is they'll experience good and evil now. Experience both order and chaos. They'll no longer experience order only. Both order and chaos now they're going to get. Well, it's ambiguous because it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What kind of knowledge are we talking about? So the devil exploits the ambiguity, and this is important for what we've been talking about in hermeneutics when it comes to divorce and remarriage, right? Exploiting the ambiguity. That is a devilish thing to do. Uh, Don't exploit the ambiguity uh, in something. uh, In other words, interpret it in light of the clear. If they had interpreted it in light of the clear, the clear is you're not to eat of it. It doesn't matter what it, you think it's going to make you. If it's, you think, oh, it's going to make us something into something good and it's going to be something good for us, beneficial for man to do it. Well, you would know it's not beneficial by uh, looking at the clearer teaching, which was don't eat it. So uh, again, just that hermeneutical principle right here in Genesis 3. So uh, the serpent tells them, of course, uh, that they, again, the serpent is the, the creature, the agent of chaos, the, the chaos creature that we know of later as the devil, the Satan, uh, the destroyer, um, those different terms or whatever that are used for him. Notice he's actually never given a title in scripture and are never going to name in scripture. He's given titles. So he's the devil. That is the slanderer, uh, the accuser. Uh, the Satan, which is the adversary, which is also an accuser. Um, uh, the destroyer, there's no need to really uh, point that out. Destroyer, he destroys, that sort of thing. Um, Satan actually is not a name. Whenever you have Satan appear in scripture, it always is with the definite article. And so even though we say Satan as though it's a name, it's actually a title. It's the adversary. Uh, uh, ha diabolos, the slanderer, the devil. Um, and, uh, and then here it's the ha nachash, the, the serpent. And John later will call him a dragon uh, who is also the serpent, who is the devil and Satan. He puts them all together in, in one in Revelation. So here uh, he's going to exploit the ambiguity and say, no, 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 no. It's going to make you masters of order and chaos. I mean, this is a good thing. This is going to help humanity out a lot. I mean, it's going to be great. So verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired, pleasurable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Now, Uh, You'll remember last time I talked about how the trees, I think, represent sexual activity. And uh, the reason why I think they do, one, is because you've got so much going on. One, in Genesis 1 and 2, you've got one command, and I would argue that the command is the same then. And, of course, the command in the first one is clearly the procreational command. But also you've got all this image of garden and fruit and all this imagery that typically is used for sexuality. Then you've got two naked people in the garden. Then you've got talk about them having sex, two becoming one flesh, and the man cleaving to his wife and all that sort of thing. And then the very last statement is that they're naked and unashamed. Um, so yeah, there's probably something to do with sexuality with the whole thing. Well, well what exactly are the trees then? Uh, I think the trees are 
the right and wrong uses of sexuality. In the ancient Near East, there is a use of sexuality to try to become uh, civilized and even godlike. You passed, it was like a type of right, using it as a right, not as a way to marry and bring up children, but as a sort of right to adulthood and even to further maturity, maybe even as deity. You see this in the Gilgamesh epic. Uh, there's a wild man that's created uh, named uh, Enkidu. And Enkidu, um, he's, like, he's in, the, he's in the, the wild lands. He won't come into the city. And so Gilgamesh actually sends out a prostitute to him. And there's this explicit scene where they have sex. Uh, this prostitute uh, has sex with him. And he then becomes wise through it. He becomes civilized and mature, passes through this rite, and then she leads him back to the city. If you're familiar with the Jungle Book, that's actually taken from that idea, um, probably from the scene in Gil- the Gilgamesh epic, to where the it's not as explicit there. Obviously, it's just a girl leading him into the town or whatever, so it's you know toned down for Disney. But uh, but that's the type of idea that you have there. In other words. It's using sexuality in some other way than being procreative in some other way that doesn't lead to life, which is why the other tree is called the tree of life, both in terms of that it's what you're pursuing in the sexuality and in terms that you would receive eternal life because you'd be in perfect obedience to God as his image. And therefore, what was dust, the mortal, would then receive eternal life from God um, as, as having uh, done his will perfectly. Now, of course, we're going to see that man does not do that and he will remain dust now. He will remain mortal uh, because of it. But ultimately, that's the idea. So what, what did Eve and Adam really do here? Well, it seems that some, they did something sexually that wasn't procreative. That's what I would argue. And again, I think you're going to see this more clearly as we go along. That this is the argument, the ethical argument of Genesis uh, that it's making, that is foundation, foundational for all Christian ethics. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, uh, she ate of it, she gave to the man who was Emma with her. So he's not off in the garden somewhere, uh, and he didn't really know what was going on. He's standing right there with her, hearing all of this. She's partaking, he's partaking with her, um, and, uh, and participating in it then. There's no protection going on. He's, he's really not, already not doing his job uh, that he was told to do, the shamar of the garden. He's not protecting the garden. So he's, he's already in sin in this whole thing. This whole thing is sin. Verse 7, then the, eye, bo- the, uh, then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So there's that knowing again. They're, they actually realized they were naked, but what does that mean? Do they really not know they were naked before in terms of just cognitive information? Well, no. It, the idea is that they now have become aware of their nakedness, of their shame, because they've done something shameful with their nakedness. That's the point. That's what connects the whole idea to where, well, this is something sexual that's going on. They, they've done something sexually that is to be ashamed of. And so because of that, now they want to cover themselves up. So they sew these fig leaves together and make uh, loincloths just to to cover their private parts. So verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I don't really care for that interpretation. It's it's actually the Spirit of God or moving in the Spirit or something of that. But whatever, whatever, we'll just, we'll pass over it for right now. I don't want to deal with the, uh, the detail. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to them, said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, and here we go with the blame game. The woman whom you gave me, whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. So then God moves on down the line. Then the, then, uh, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So then he moves down to the serpent. 
And uh, he doesn't bother asking him a question. He's just going to judge. Obviously, your ear knows what's going on. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all the beasts of the field. Now, there's a play on words here. In the beginning, in verse 1, it says that the serpent was arum, more than any beast of the field. Arum is, he was shrewder, crafty. It was actually seen as like a good attribute almost. He's now misused it to uh, sin. So he was arum. Now he's going to be arur, more than any beast of the field. Arur means to be cursed. So uh, from arum to arur. Uh, cursed above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. <coughs> On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now, I want you to notice here, uh, this is where people typically say, well, see, it's just a literal snake. Um, and this is the origin of the snake having to crawl on its belly and things like that. I don't think that's what's going on. I think that the imagery of a snake crawling on the belly and eating dust, because as it moves along, it's dust in its mouth. And as it eats, it's getting dust in its mouth. Not that it, not that it literally eats dust, because serpents don't eat dust. But it does get dust and dirt in its mouth. Yeah, I've seen that numerous times, um, having owned snakes. And so... Uh, I think it's the imagery showing the fall of the divine creature, this supernatural creature, his fall by presenting it in terms of the lowliness and humility of the serpent. He was clearly a high up angel of some sort or some sort of creature that was in the garden and uh, likely a beautiful, we're, we're told that, the, the, that he can appear as an angel of light. So he likely was a creature of light and those sorts of things. Um, and here he falls in humility here because of his sin in deceiving the woman and corrupting humanity in this way. So I think this is imagery. I don't think it's literally saying, yeah, this is what happened to a snake originally. I think it's saying th this, is your, this is your humiliation. <coughs> I will put hostility, that is, I'm going to make enemies between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, your offspring and her offspring, this is important, he will bruise or crush your head and you will bruise or crush his heel. Same word used there. Um, there's a lot in this verse. This is called the Proto-Evangelium. Uh, it's the, uh, the uh, Proto-Gospel, the first mention of the Gospel, that, that sort of idea. But I want to see what it would have been understood as before. We understand that to be the case now. That's absolutely true. In Genesis, when they first got this, they probably would not have understood this um, in that way. They would have understood it to mean there's going to be two types of people. And that's what we're going to see Genesis is going to do. Two types of people. And we're going to, I'm going to argue those two types of people are the seed of the woman and seed of the serpent. And it's not biological, it's a kind of people in terms of what they do. In terms of whether they're going to be the image of God and fall back into relationship with God in that way, in terms of their sexuality and how they use it, or they're going to want to be like God and not the image of God and do their own thing. Now, this is important because it goes back to what is Genesis 1 actually telling us? I just read today an article, and I hear this all the time, that Genesis 1 is about us kind of being God's little pictures, that we're like God in a way, and, and that we have a stewardship in creation, and you know we can like kind of control uh, nature in a certain way. What does that sound like? Does that sound like Genesis 1, you being like the image? Not like God, like the image, like the likeness of God, not like God. Or does that sound like Genesis 3, that you're going to be masters of order and chaos, you'll be able to control nature yourself and be a steward for nature, and, and you'll be like God in that way? That sounds a lot more like what the serpent is promising than God says in Genesis 1. And yet many people, many people, because they disconnect the command in Genesis 1.27 <coughs> and 128, to be fruitful and multiply and fill up the earth to subdue it and rule over it, they act as though the be fruitful part is a different command than the rest of it. So rule over the earth, take dominion. Yeah, that means that you, you control nature and 
You can control things and control your sexuality and all that sort of thing because that's part of the mastery that God gives us in nature. That's not what Genesis 1 is saying. That's what Genesis 3 is promising through the serpent's mouth. Genesis 1 is saying, no, you do this God's way and you subdue and rule over the earth through God's way. And God's way is that you reverse uh, the chaos uh, as his image as you have children, so be fruitful in order to multiply. Multiply in order to fill up the earth. Fill up the earth in order to subdue it. Subdue it in order to rule over it. In other words, you can go backwards. How do I rule over the earth? Well, I first have to subdue it. How do I subdue it according to God? Well, I have to fill it up. Well, how do I fill it up with humans? Well, I have to, be, I have to multiply. Well, how do I multiply? Well, I have to be fruitful. It's all one thing. You can't break it apart and say, well, there's a cultural mandate, and within the cultural mandate is this creation, procreative mandate. And it's like, no, 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 no. The procreative mandate is the whole thing, and then you can springboard from there. But you can't do springboard by negating it and saying, well, yeah, we're supposed to be like God and control nature and control our sexuality. And it's like, no, that's not what it's saying. So all of that is the wrong way to look at it. It does not, it's not cuh, uh, God, like you have, like Elohim here, it's, it's ka demut, that is like a likeness in Genesis 1. The devil is promising that you'll actually be like God and you now get to control nature. You now get to control your sexuality and do what's right and wrong in your own eyes with it. That is the very deceptive command, or deceptive, uh, uh, the very deception that the devil is giving in, in the beginning. This idea that you are like God and you can decide for yourself what you do with your sexuality rather than being procreative. So he finally gets to the beast. He, he puts the beast. He, t- he tells uh, the woman there's going to be these two seeds. We're going to see the two seeds play out literarily right after this with Cain and Abel and then in the genealogies and then on and on throughout the Bible, we're going to see it. Obviously, the ultimate the ultimate seed of the woman is going to be Christ. He is the one who crushes the head of the serpent like immediately and and just forever. Um, Destroys chaos forever by what he does. And in that very moment, the serpent kills him as well. So by the serpent striking his heel and killing him and he crushes the head of the serpent in that very instance on the cross, he he, uh, settles creation forever. God's plan will go forth. That's it. It's done. It's not even a. It's not. A, it's not even a possibility to be otherwise now. So, um, so in that way, yes. I mean, who ultimately brings us back as the the image par excellence in terms of preserving all humanity who believes in him on the face of the earth? Who seals the deal for creation? Who is the instrument through whom God creates all things? Well, it's the image, Jesus Christ. We understand then we have to participate in him in order to get back there. Um, so he is the image par excellence, but, but what, do, what do people do in the meantime? Well, they follow God in the light that God has given them in the Old Testament. And they try to be the image in that way. And so that's the way the image is depicted in Genesis, that it's those who are going to go back and try to obey the procreative command. They're not going to receive eternal life now because of it um, in the garden, because they've been, they're going to be kicked out of the garden. They're not going to get it. Uh, but ultimately, they will receive eternal life once Christ perfectly obeys, because they're not going to perfectly obey God and not going not to be able to acquire life themselves that way. Verse 16, to the woman, he said, so now here's the woman's judgment. I will greatly multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you will bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband, but he must rule over you. There's a lot to discuss here. I don't know if I really can get to all of it, but let me just say a few things here. What's going to happen now in the judgment of the man and the woman is that God is going to take the two things in order for them to be the image that were in the role, in their roles, respective roles in being the image, and he's going to make them harder for, the, for them to do. Um, the man was to, remember, take care of the sacred space in order to uh, provide a place for human beings 
so that he could procreate with the woman. And the woman's job was to uh, have the babies, ultimately. Now it's going to be painful. And the same word's going to be used for both of them. They're going to have pain in doing this. Um, it's going to be laborious for them to do it now. It's going to be hard for them to now fulfill what God has commanded them to fill, fulfill. Um, and so the woman's going to have pain in childbirth, in bearing children, in having sons, literally it says, but we obviously mean children in general. Um, it's clear, though, that she's to still have them. It's just going to be much more difficult to have them. But that also shows that that was always her role, even in the garden. This isn't a curse that, well, now you're going to have to have children. <coughs> Obviously, from the uh, procreative command, she was always to have children. That was her role. That's why she was made as a helper for the man. Um, he wasn't able to have children on his own, obviously. So the woman was created to, uh, according to his side. So she's going to have this pain now. Um, the second phrase that, that sa- says your desire will be for your husband is not sexual desire. There's a parallel he- here in chapter four where God says to Cain that sin, its desire is for you. But then it gives the second clause, but you must rule over it. You must master it. So we understand the desire of sin is to master Cain, but instead, in contrast, this is a disjunctive clause. It's a disjunctive vav, um, but, but in contrast to that, you must master it. It's the exact same phrase. The only thing different here are the pronouns that are changed uh, because of the people involved. So your desire will be for your husband. You will actually desire to master your husband. But he must rule over you. He must master you instead. He must be the governor over you. Why? Well, that's what just happened. He didn't do that before and everything fell. If you want to restore anything, if you want to survive now, he's going to have to be the master of you. Um, and then restore that as much as you can. If you want to be the image of God at all, you're going to have to restore that picture, even though now you're going to desire to rule him. Because now in this land of chaos, you're going to be like, oh, well, I don't think this guy knows what he's doing. Maybe I should take control because of that fear. Uh, Peter says that's why you need to submit and obey without fear. Uh, without fear, because you understand that God ultimately is in control. But that, that's what it should be translated. Not just that you know, he will rule over you as though this is an effect of the fall or something, but he must rule over you. This is an important thing. He has to do this. You, you need, you want this uh, from him. Now, verse 17, finally to the man, and to Adam he said, to the man he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Normally that's a phrase that you would get, you listen to the voice of Yahweh. Because you've listened to the voice of your wife instead of Yahweh, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Here's the ground that he was supposed to cultivate, make it into living space. Now it's cursed. In pain, here's the same pain as the woman, in pain, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Uh, So the shrubbery of the field, no longer these great fruit of the trees and this glorious garden with God, but out in the field now in the uncreated lands in this dust and this thorns and thistles, obviously not literal, but it's trying to show the, the difficulty of, of actually getting food now and, and, and protecting and making this space where they can live. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, return to, so the uh, Adam is going to return to the Adamah for of it you were taken, for you are dust, and you will return to dust. Now, I want you to notice that, again, I said this earlier, he was dust originally, but then God breathed into him, gave him that job in the garden, his job as his image. He would have been cared for as the image. He would have always been able to be in the temple of God, which is the sanctuary. It would have expanded and eventually taken over the world. And that was what God would have given him and that he would have then received life. (coughs) Having partaken of the tree of life, 
That is, having been God's instrument in creation, using sexuality for procreation instead of anti-creation, he would have then been given eternal life by God. But he doesn't do that, and so now he is dust, and he'll return to dust. It doesn't say you're immortal, and now you'll turn into dust. He was dust, and he lost the chance at immortality, and now he'll return to dust. Um, this is also, if you, you want a story that's similar to this, in the Gilgamesh epic, Gilgamesh is actually going into the netherworld. He's trying to find uh, eternal life, like what's the key? How, how do you actually live forever? What's the key to life? And he finds a, a tree of life. So it's actually a symbol, a tree of life. It's called the tree of life. And interesting enough, a serpent comes along while he's doing something and steals it away. And in this regard, you kind of see maybe, maybe a, a, this imagery is being used because of that story. But obviously in this text, the tree of life means something very different. And it would have been gained through becoming not just, you know, uprooting it like Gilgamesh did, but, but actually being in obedience to God and, and the command that was given. And the serpent, of course, steals it away, not literally by taking it in his mouth, but by deceiving and saying that you don't really need to obey that command. You don't really need to be the image. You can be like God himself. You can do what you want with your sexuality, yourself. And, you know, uh, to apply that, you can do what you want, period, yourself. Since sexuality is at the very base of what humanity is commanded by God. And it represents often the entire Torah, the entire teaching of God and all the commands. Which is why, by the way, this is not just a, some sort of uh, idiosyncratic interpretation, you'll have Jews argue all the time that the tree of life is the Torah, uh, that they think it's actually the commandments given, so the, all the commandments are being given to Adam or whatever. That, I don't think that's the case at all. It's clear that the command given is the one in one. And so the tree of life is actually the command in Genesis 1. All right, verse 20. The man named his wife Eve, uh, Chava, because she was the mother of all the Chai living. And so uh, you may not know this, Eve's name is actually Chava. Uh, it gets kind of transliterated into Latin as Eve, but it's actually Chava. So I mean, if you ever watch Fiddler on the Roof, one of their daughters is named Chava. That's actually, uh, it just means living one. And uh, she's named that because she's the mother of all the living. Notice the man names her. He named the animals before, now he names her. Uh, which is a display of authority in the ancient Near East, showing that he actually has authority over her, as he was supposed to have, according to what God just said. He's supposed to actually uh, be the governor uh, over her. He's supposed to rule over her. Um, the Lord God made clothing from skins for the man and his wife, uh, and he clothed them. Now, where did the skins come from? Well, this is often viewed as the first sacrifice that God makes for them, a blood sacrifice on their behalf. Of course, the text doesn't really say this, but again, given a kind of priestly context of Genesis and argument and all that sort of thing, that you know, you can kind of maybe see that. Verse 22, the Lord God said, since the man has become like one of us, now in what way have we become like one of us, like one of them? Uh, he says, knowing good and evil, there's the infinitive, not a parsable, not a master of good and evil, not a master of order and chaos, but one who experiences it, knowing in the sense of experiencing um, in that way. Uh, he must not reach out because he's like what could become one of us, knowing he's going to experience uh, good and evil. So his creation is not complete. He must not reach out, take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. Now you might say, well, that sounds like a literal tree then that he is reaching out and eating. Again, I think this is imagery, meaning if he goes back into the garden and he starts being procreative and he starts uh, being in relationship with God, in other words, if God were to accept him back into relationship with him into the garden and just seal him there as he was, the problem is, is now he's let sin and chaos in. He, now he's imperfect. Now he actually has wickedness in him and he would be eternal because God then would give him eternal life, but eternal life as a wicked person or as a fallen creature. And so that is not God's goal. That's not what God wants to do with humanity upon the earth. He wants to perfect humanity and perfect his creation in order to complete it. And so he's got to, he's got to kick him out of the garden. Now uh, it's interesting the way this is said, 
It says, since the man has become like one of us, who are the one of us? Again, this is something from Genesis 1, let let us make man in our image. And you're kind of like, are there more than one God? Uh, A lot of people think, oh, it's the council of the gods. But I would argue that the council of the gods is not being represented by an image, one image. You have one God represented by the one image. And so uh, it's not, and it's not that God's representing other gods or other angels with different humans or whatever. Um, I think, I think very much it simply would have not been understood except as the divine counsel to them, but they would have been wrong because it always would have been off. Because again, you don't represent a divine counsel with a singular image. You represent one God that way. So that this is the one God calling himself us and talking to others. Now, I think this is why only Christians can really understand this verse and make sense of it and it makes sense of all the ancient or Eastern data that goes along with it by saying, this is the Trinity. Um, this is the father talking to the son and the spirit and saying that the man has become like us and that he will experience both uh, order and chaos, but not as masters as God is. So it's interesting this is also expressed by a figure of speech called apostiopasis, which is a sudden cutting off. And uh, what it literally says in the Hebrew, some of your translations may note this. It says, uh, since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, um, if he should reach out and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever, and it cuts off. And the idea is that if he were to do that, it would be such a horror If I were to give him eternal life right now, if he were to actually partake of eternal life in the state that he is right now, that would be awful because he's in a, he's in a corrupt state. And so that's the implied thing. Now, now Genesis doesn't tell you that he's corrupted. It does tell you that the ground is cursed. Uh, He is cursed because he's going to die. The woman is cursed because they're suffering. She's suffering pain. The man is cursed, but he's suffering pain. Trying to get so there is a curse going on. It doesn't really tell you that they themselves are corrupted. That's you don't get that until later. But you see that as their offspring seems corrupt, and when God makes a statement after the flood that man is basically evil from his youth, you understand that humanity actually has been corrupted here, and therefore you see the horror of why this would be so bad if he were to be given eternal life at this point. So verse 23, so because of this, the Lord God sent him away from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out and stationed the cherubim and the flaming with a flaming sword, a flaming whirling sword east of the garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. In other words, you cannot come back into the presence of God as uh, as his perfect uh, obedient image in the sanctuary and have a relationship with him and get to eternal life that way again. You cannot get it that way. What's interesting is that notice it's the east of the Garden of Eden. And you have this imagery again in Ezekiel that where you have the temple described as the garden and no one is allowed to come in the east gate. Only God. God comes in the east gate and one other. And that's the Davidic king, the Messiah. The Messiah can come in the east gate. Why? Because he comes in to fellowship with God. And in his fellowship with God, he restores humanity in that relationship that humanity had with God, bringing them back in uh, so as the perfect image so that all humanity now will also be able to come back in and partake of God's new heavens and new earth, his completed heavens and a completed earth that is the Garden of Eden everywhere. And so the Messiah will accomplish what Adam failed to do, the, the, the original humans failed to do. But this sets them now, they are out and they have died now. This is a view, this is a way of the ancient Near Eastern world seeing that they have died. Now this is a big controversy because people are like, well, they don't li- literally die for another, you know, 900 something years. I mean, how do they die that day? It says on the day they eat of it, they'll die. Well, understand that death is seen as stages in the ancient areas. There's life is the middle. So that's in the middle of the garden where God was and these trees were. Um, And then you get a little bit further, but it's still there's life there. 
But then you start going outside that sphere that's protected by the presence of God, and you're starting to enter into the land of death and chaos, which is what the field represents. This is why the ground is thorns and thistles. It's uncultivated. It's, it's where the wild animals who represent like the demonic later on in scripture. Um, it, it, this is the land of death. Later on, we're going to see Cain is put fur, further out into the land of death because that's his death sentence going out further away. And then ultimately we're going to see that everybody is brought further away by actually dying, physically dying. But it's, it needs to be understood that their death occurs on that day. That would have been seen as death. Moving from this land of the living to the land of chaos and death is death. It's like moving to the netherworld. And you just keep dying in stages from there. The fact that death is seen in stages is everywhere in the ancient Near East. I have it in my book as well showing that it, death is seen as uh, it's further away you move from the land of the living. Um, but, but it's understood that you're still in the realm of death at that point. The, the very first step into the land of death is death even though you may not have gone to the, the final sphere of being away from the land of the living. So um, it happens that day. They're now in the land of death. And if you're reading this story in the ancient Near East, you're like, wow, this is just absolute despair. So this is where we are then. We right now are in the land of death and there is no hope. Um, and we're in the land of chaos. And now we're, just, we're mortal and we're going to return to our mortality. We're all going to die and that's going to be it. Now, of course, the good news for us is that we know the rest of the story and we know that ultimately that's not the end, that the end ends in the garden with us being restored to our God as his images through the image of the invisible God, Jesus Christ, um, as our messianic king, ruling a world that has been completed as people who have been completed and given eternal life in a state where our chaos has been removed from us through the cross. And so that ultimately is what I think we should get from Genesis 3. Uh, the argument will continue and we'll see how it unfolds as we continue on through 4 and 5 next week. But let's now end in a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you so much for your word. It is awesome. All of the imagery, I couldn't possibly describe it as well and the picture as well as uh, for people to see for themselves, but I, I, I've done my best in, in trying to explain the, uh, the artistry of this passage, the symbols that are in it, and the, the glorious theology and the ethics that it conveys uh, of, of man in terms of being your image and the instrument of creation and what has happened to mankind and how evil has entered the world and remembering how this contributes to the overall theodicy of Genesis as to why evil exists in the world. Man has put it there, and yet God has planned to use it uh, as a means of his creation in ordering the world. Man is incapable of doing that. Man is not like God, uh, but he, he can bind himself to God as his image and have God work through him so that he creates his world through him um, and participates in it. Father, I thank you so much for this passage. We understand then that the fall of man is a horrific thing uh, in terms of not because he went from immortality to mortality, but because he really was offered immortality at, from as a mortal and instead lost that offer because of what he had done. Uh, Father, I pray that we do not follow in the steps of Adam any longer as those who have gained his nature, but rather having gained the new nature of Jesus Christ, we are able to be restored to you and we live as those who are the seed of the woman and not the seed of the serpent. In this we pray for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.